So welcome everybody to our webinar on planning your Citizen Science Day event. Really glad to have so many folks with us. A quick logistic reminder um, that because we are expecting a lot of people on this webinar, we have audio turned off for attendees, but we do have an active conversation going on in the chat window which if you're on via the computer, you can find in your menu bar under the three dots um, in the icon bar. My name's Jennifer Shirk. I'm the Interim Executive Director for the Citizen Science Association, a partner on the Citizen Science Day event with a number of other organizations, in particular SciStarter. And just wanted to quickly give you um, an introduction to the Citizen Science Association and to the webinar series. Um, the Citizen Science Association, as many of you know, is working hard to advance and support this diverse, disruptive, and growing field of practice around public participation in scientific research. And among the goals that we have to advance this work are those to provide access to tools and resources and to support professional development across this field. And this webinar series is one effort to start serving some of those interests for many different types of citizen science projects and practitioners in many different roles. And we have had several webinars already to date. My slides are very slow to advance here, um, including webinars on volunteer recruitment, on the SciStarter website and tools, and most recently on journals and the culture of peer review, really trying to peel back layers on different entry points into citizen science, the culture of science, the tools and resources that are out there for people serving many different roles in this field. And really pleased to have a webinar focused on how to plan a citizen science day event to bring more attention to maybe your project or maybe other projects that you're interested in sharing with the public. Our next webinar is one that we're actually promoting for colleagues from Eye on Earth uh, in a partnership to advance a global practice for citizen science. It will be March 7th, bright and early in the morning because it's hosted in Abu Dhabi. And it's an effort to bring together citizen science collaborations globally to, in particular, address sustainable development goals and the UN's big goal to engage a billion citizens uh, by the end of this decade. So if you're interested in global issues related to citizen science, please tune in for this and you can watch our blog for uh, registration details. Again, as I mentioned, just some housekeeping and logistics for this webinar. Um, we are keeping everyone muted just because it's a large group on the line. Uh, but please do introduce yourself in the chat, ask questions in the chat window. I will be monitoring the chat throughout this whole presentation and really encourage you to type your questions in there um, that we will offer to our presenters at the appropriate time for them to engage. So without uh, taking any more of your time in background information, I'd like to turn it over to our three uh, panelists today, in particular to Richard Smart um, at the LA Natural History Museum, who will introduce his co-presenters, who are going to give you an orientation to Citizen Science Day and ways that you can um, access resources and put together a really great event at your site. So with that said, um, Richard, I think you can now go ahead and share your screen and get things underway. Wonderful. Um, well, welcome everybody to our Citizen Science Day webinar. I'm really excited to be here um, and uh, excited to share with you some wonderful information. Um, a little bit of information about me. I am um, a coordinator in our community science program here at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. And I am also one of three co-chairs on the Citizen Science Task Force that's part of the Citizen Science Association. 
Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and let Libby introduce herself. Hello, I'm Libby Elwood, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the La Brea Tar Pits, which is actually part of the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. And today I'm representing We Dig Bio, the worldwide engagement for digitizing bio collections global transcription event. Pietro. Hello, uh, I'm Pietro Michelucci. Uh, I'm director at the Human Computation Institute and uh, working on the Eyes on ALS project um, with a, a large and active uh, team of collaborators. Uh, so excited to be a uh, part of this and uh, look forward to uh, hearing from everyone. All right. Um, so I wanna show you this slide so everyone has an idea of um, the outline for this presentation. Um, the first three sections are um, items that I'm going to go over, and I expect that this will take about 15 minutes. Um, after this section is done, uh, we will have about five minutes for questions. So if you have any questions for what I've gone through, um, that'll be a time that when we can address them. Once my section is done, um, Libby will go and talk about We Dig Bio. Her section will take about 10 minutes, and once again, we'll have five minutes for questions, and then Pietro will go and talk about Eyes on Owls and Stall Catchers, and then once again, five minutes for questions. Um, and then the last closing section, we'll have about five minutes, so we could address a couple more questions if we have time, and then we'll also talk about um, some next steps and how you can stay in contact with each of us. Um, so I want to begin with talking a little bit about the history of Citizen Science Day. This is the third year that we will be celebrating Citizen Science Day. Um, Citizen Science Day came about through the Citizen Science Association and SciStarter, wanting to celebrate the work of citizen scientists and the diversity of projects that are out there. And there are also several federal agencies that were wanting to find a way to broaden the reach um, and raise more awareness about Citizen Science Day. And that's really what Citizen Science Day is about, is raising awareness reaching um, the general public and hopefully reaching a new audience um, through something fun. And so the first Citizen Science Day was on April 16th, 2016. And there were two really big events happening that year. There was the US Science and Engineering Festival in April and the National Parks anniversary in May. And so with those two events, um, it was decided that while Citizen Science Day was officially one day, celebrations um, could be held throughout between those two months. So Citizen Science Day um, is about a month long. Um, last year, the two events that anchored Citizen Science Day were the City Nature Challenge in April and the Citizen Science Association Conference in May. And this year, Citizen Science Day is taking place on April 14th. And once again, we encourage celebrations throughout April and May. And I really like that because if this official day doesn't work for your institution or your organization because you have other things taking place or you have an event that's already on your books that you um, is very well attended and you want to take advantage of that um, you can uh, fit your citizen uh, your event into citizen science day because it celebrations can take place through april and may all right and i did want to talk a little bit about our citizen science day task force um, you can see at the bottom of that screen, um, there are three co-chairs for there, Allison Young and Katherine Hoffman. And um, I'm a new recent co-chair on it. And we are a part of the Citizen Science Association and our job is to grow and sustain Citizen Science Day. And with that, we are um, always looking to have more insight and more ideas and learn how we can better support different organizations and different members and different people with their Citizen Science Day celebration. So if you all either would like to join our Citizen Science Day task force, or if you have um, ideas that you wanna share directly with us, please contact us. Um, I will be showing the screen again, so if you're not able to write this all down, that's okay. Um, but we would love to hear from you and to learn what your ideas are. All right, so getting into the resources, what people are here for. Um, I'm gonna go over two main sources of resources right now. Um, one is from the Citizen Science Association at citizenscience.org. And then um, after that, I will talk about resources available on SciStarter. So these are different types of resources available to you 
to help you promote um, and organize and develop your Citizen Science Day event. All right, so for the Citizen Science Association, um, there should be some links in the chat box that you can look at if you wanna go directly to some of the different websites. So at the top of one of the links is the, the link to the CSA Citizen Science Day webpage. I'll be showing screenshots from the, from the website so you don't have to log onto the website, but I really wanna make sure that you all know that we did update our CSA um, Citizen Science Day page to have a lot more resources available for you this year. Um, you can provide a link to our previous webinar where um, we talked a lot about uh, SciStarter. We had, there's a lot of good conversations regarding Citizen Science Day, and particularly there was a great deep dive into how to run a BioBlitz. So that could be a good thing for you all to look at if you're thinking you wanna do a BioBlitz or the webinar from last year is still available for you. Um, here's also a list of different logos and promotional items that you may use. This list is still being updated. Um, we still have to add our 2018 press releases onto here, but those are coming very soon. And one thing I really like is that social media kit. That's something that's been developed very uh, recently and updated, where we have a lot of different tweets and Instagram posts that you can use, that you can cut and paste to help you promote your event, or you can modify to help promote your event. So please take advantage um, of these resources here. And please also use our hashtag, which is hashtag SitSideDay2018. Um, but also on this page, we have a list of resources that were created by our Citizen Science Task Force. And right now the page is divided into in-person events on top, and if you keep scrolling down, you'll find um, resources related to online events. And what I really like about this is that they're categorized into different things that you may wanna ho host um, for, uh, at your institution or as part of your organization. And you can click on any of those links and they will give you information on how to host a science cafe, um, information about uh, how to do a photography training for your um, participants, bio blitz guides and different types of bio blitz guides. So you can really look at these resources to figure out what works best for you and how you can maybe expand your scope. So you don't have to um, invent things um, and you can adapt as needed. The online events, also, at their really great, um, exciting stuff on here. Um, and as I mentioned, these, this list will continue to grow, we'll continue to update this list. If you have ideas on other things that we can add to here that your organization has used or created, please let us know. We would love to include those on here. Um, and once again, a shout out to the Citizen Science Task Force for creating this wonderful uh, resource for everyone. All right, so we're going to transition now to SciStarter. Um, SciStarter is definitely one of the, the big uh, uh, supporters of Citizen Science Day, and so they have some great resources related to us. So this is what you're seeing here on my screen, um, and there's the link up at the top, which uh, you can get out of the chat box again. This screenshot is a brand new um, web page that they've put up, I believe just yesterday, um, talking about Citizen Science Day. So this is a great place for you to find events, for your participants to find events in their area, and a great place for you to advertise your event. Um, so this is a, a view of the event list. So when you add your Citizen Science Day event to SciStarter, your event will be listed on here and it will be searchable and people will be able to view it. They can click on the map view, map view and they'll be able to look um, for different locations to find out and uh, what events are going on in their area or other organizers can find out what events are going on in their area that they might wanna be a part of. So to really get your event out there and help get it promoted, we definitely recommend adding it to Size Starter. So how do you do that? Um, the first thing you do is go to the Size Starter website and then you click on add event. Um, step three is creating an account or signing in. Um, you don't have to be signed in right away when you go to this webpage, uh, but you can click on add event and you can get there. 
Um, you'll need to fill out basic information about your event, um, including definitely how to register, contact information, and event description, and base, other basic information about your event. One thing I definitely approach it, definitely include the city because people usually look by location when talking about their event or when finding events. Um, a brand new feature to Size Starter is the People Finder. Um, I was just playing around with this yesterday. And when you go to um, SciStarter.com slash people dash finder, you can click on here and you can find different members that are part of SciStarter. And as you can see here, I clicked on Los Angeles. It brought up a list of 718 participants, 13 project owners. And by a click of a button, I can send a message to all of these people. So this is a great tool to help you promote, communicate, and connect with other people regarding your Citizen Science Day event. Um, as part of the Citizen Science Day uh, site starter, they can help promote your events as well. I put Katherine Hoffman's email up again at the top because if you have questions about site starter and how they can help promote your um, event through these networks, she's a great resource. Um, on our website, the CSA website, we have examples of some of these events, but I'm going to do a qu uh, quick dive into the events that we've done at the Natural History Museum. So just last year, right before Citizen Science Day, we held the last of our panel discussions in a series titled Citizen Science and Suds. So this was a lecture, but we held it off-site at a bar that's a partner of our museum. And a panel discussion was great because we had more than one speaker. We had a great time for Q&A. It was um, a lively discussion. And so we definitely would encourage you having some type of presentation and find a way to make it fun um, by either making it a panel discussion, holding it off-site in a new location, a way for you to attract new people. Now festivals. Our museum is known for festivals that attract thousands of people, but our community science program, we are not, we don't have that capacity yet to host an event that large, but for the very first Citizen Science Day, what we did is we created a slideshow that was broadcast on the walls of our main lobby at our museum. So when people walked in, they could learn how about our community science program and how they could participate. And then we also had a scavenger hunt. People could visit our table, pick up a little booklet, and they interacted with all of our museum staff to learn about our different projects, learn how they can participate in them. And there was even, um, uh, example of the scavenger hunt where they actually did submit a photo to our LA nature map. Um, so I thought this was a, is a very scalable and doable festival type thing that you can do. Um, but if some of you already have festivals going on, we want to make sure you also know about the Science Festival Alliance. Um, it's a great way to um, connect with people about science festivals, uh, promote your science festival, and once again to find out what's going on in your neck of the woods that you can be a part of. All right, some pro tips that I would recommend um, regarding nature walks and BioBlitz events. If you can, build into your existing programming. At our museum, we, have, we regularly have 3.30 nature walks. So during Citizen Science Day, it's very easy for us to leverage those walks to have a citizen science component to them, um, where people are either looking for birds and adding them to their eBird list, um, and, and start gallery interpreters doing that, or they're using iNaturalist to add items to our different projects. Uh, we've also leveraged this Science Day to um, get people to go out to a new area to collect data, and whether it's an area where we have a data gap and our scientists are interested in there, so this is, it's exciting for them to be a part of, and then we can get the community out there. Um, it's a really neat thing to do. Um, use it as a training. So Citizen Science Day, is, since it's so heavily marketed, um, it's a great way to get people to get their first step into you doing citizen science. So it could be a training for your participants, for the public. It could be for your volunteers, for your staff, a great way for you to expand. Um, and finally, bringing a guest. Um, when I say bring a guest, a lot of times people think I mean an expert, a PhD researcher, a scientist. And that's, of course, they are very valuable to have out there. But in this photo, we have two of our iNaturalist power users on here. And so they have such expert knowledge. They are so good at bio blitzing that we have invited them out to many of our programs to demonstrate how to do use iNaturalist to be that friendly face 
um, to connect with our participants. So you may have people like that who are really great ambassadors for your program and definitely feel free and I encourage you to use them as one of your featured guests. Um, going into my last few slides, I'm gonna talk about recognition. Um, you have so many different types of recognition events that you can have. At our museum, we've had formal recognition events for our um, community scientists. The first screen is one where our, uh, we had um, a presentation by our museum president, press was there, it was, people were on a stage, so it was very formal, but it was very nice. People, our participants really felt honored. Um, but depending on what you can do and what your scalability is, maybe you need to do something more informal. So the photo in the middle is Max Marvila. He participated in one of our projects and got first place in his science fair because of that. And so we held a small ice cream party for him and his family. Um, where he also got the behind the scenes tour with our scientists and he got to bring his poster and we got to take photos. So it was really great. Um, we've done thank you parties for our participants, whether it's a thank you for their continued participation or the end of a project. Um, you can do small things like that, like a pizza party on Citizen Science Day for your participants is a wonderful thing. And you can also honor some of your participants by having them write a guest blog or write something on your social media, which is what we did with Brett Potter, turn one of our projects or his participation into an Eagle Scout project. Um, social media recognition is great. Um, these examples here, while not directly connected to Citizen Science Day, these are things that we have done throughout the year. And I, this is something I really want to do this year. I want to really coordinate a social media campaign, probably over the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, where I, uh, we honor different participants in our community science program, and also honor uh, whether it's individuals, such as we have Rachel Ann and Gianni and Arlinda highlighted here, or it's honoring people as a project as a whole and recognizing the hundreds of participants uh, and the thousands of data points that they've added. So I recommend social media recognition um, as some way to build capacity. Um, the last thing I also want you to think about is the City Nature Challenge. Um, I like the idea of Citizen Science Day being a way to um, uh, be a part of the City Nature Challenge. So whether during April 27th through 30th, your or, uh, people in your organization are taking part in the City Nature Challenge, that can be a part of Citizen Science Day um, participation. Or if you're doing your events earlier, the training and the programs that you do in coordination with Citizen Science Day can almost be the training and practice for taking part in the City Nature Challenge. I encourage you all to visit that website and learn more about it. All right, um, and lastly, once again, going back to SciStarter, you might think, all right, he's given good ideas. I have an idea of different projects and events and programs I can do, but I don't know what Citizen Science projects to feature or to have people participate in. Well, definitely please use the project finder on SciStarter so you can find projects um, around your area. So they don't have to be projects that you and your team are, um, are running out of your own office. Citizen Science Day is a great way to participate in another organization's project and the SciStarter um, project finder is wonderful for that. All right, so this is my last slide for now. Uh, we'll be um, transitioning to Libby um, in just a moment. Um, so I just want to once again invite people to contact us on the Citizen Science Day Task Force. Once again, if you have ideas on how we can better support you or you would like to be a part of the task force, just reach out to Allison, Catherine, or myself. Um, I know I've gone a little long. Is that, uh, Jennifer, do we have time for a few questions? Sure, well I did just want to uh, let folks know that if you have questions, so please add them into the chat because we're a large group. We have folks muted. Um, there are two quick things that came up. One, I think we've clarified via the chat, that photo, is it a weasel? That photo, oh. you showed many photos. There was one that was really intriguing as- The social media photo? Yeah. This one? Yeah. So what do we yes. see there? It was, um, that is a weasel holding a gopher that's as big as it's bigger as his body. And I saw that on our LA nature map. And I thought that was perfect for Thanksgiving. That's what, so I made a note that before stuffing ourselves, we want to thank our uh, 
community scientists. That's great. Thank you for clarifying that. A little bit more topically, um, somebody wanted to clarify what the hashtag is for the event. On the slide, it said hashtag SitSciDay. I think you said SitSciDay 2018. What should we be using? Please use SitSciDay 2018. Okay. Um, that page is a little bit of a, almost like an evergreen page. So each year we ask that people use the, the, the new year. So hashtag sit side day 2018. Great. Thank you so much for your presentation. I'm sure as people are going through and uh, the, the whole series of talks, more questions will emerge. Please do feel free to keep adding those into the chat. One of the things that I'm excited to see on this webinar is uh, the range of shapes and characters and flavors that Citizen Science Day celebrations can take on. So uh, be thinking to yourselves in what you're planning, um, not that any of these things have to work for you, but what of these things might work for you, what new ideas you might be able to do for Citizen Science Day at your event, um, and we can address questions either about specific kinds of Citizen Science Day opportunities or more general resources about how to host and promote a Citizen Science Day event in general. So really looking forward to the range of ideas that are coming out across this community, including the opportunity um, that Eileen in Phoenix just posted that she might be doing some Citizen Science at Comic-Con, which I'm just so thrilled to hear about. Um, so Richard, I think you're already muted. Um, if you want to chime in, please do. But I think it's about time to turn it over to Libby Elwood, also at the museum there in, El uh, in, in LA. Um, and here, more to reflect on one type of Citizen Science Day event that she has held in the past. And Libby, I will let you take it from here. Thank you. Super, great. Thanks, guys. Let me share my screen here. And hopefully that looks all right. And thank you, Richard. That was a perfect uh, lead-in to, uh, to what I'm going to talk about, which provides some specific examples for some of the opportunities and resources that you described. And so today I'm going to introduce a little bit about We Dig Bio, which is worldwide engagement for digitizing bio collections. And it's a, a hybrid type event where we have online and on-site um, events. And who we are and what we do and why we do it and my goal is not only to tell you about we dig bio but to hopefully give you the the resources that you'll be able to then apply to your own events um, and or potentially even host we dig bio event yourself so we dig bio if my screen will advance here Working on it. Oh, there we go. Hopefully it doesn't advance 18 times now, but let's see here. So the natural history collections community has an interesting problem. And that problem is that a lot of our collections exist only in their analog hard copy format or uh, as a specimen itself. And what we'd like to do is to digitize these specimens and allow them to be accessible by anybody in the world uh, with an internet connection. And so in this panel here on the left side, you'll see the, the herbarium specimens, the pressed plant specimens housed in cabinets. And on the right side, you see their digital, the digital data that has been added to each specimen. And then that, that would be available to folks doing research, to folks interested in sharing this with educational opportunities and this type of thing. So uh, that's what we would like to be able to do as a natural history collection community is digitize as much as we can and make those data available. But the task of digitizing all of the specimens we have, which is on the order of billions, is really pretty daunting. And so that's when citizen science um, can really help with that. And so through We Dig Bio, we have organized mass digitization events that focus on, on the science behind um, all the biodiversity and uh, also building the community around this type of these types of topics and of course informing people about our collections and the vast resources that that they are and throughout my talk here I'll be I'll, I've included some images from past events that we've had and the participants and hosts that have been a part of it so there you see um, a year and a half ago the event that was hosted in India and so it's a fully inclusive event we have 
people from small and large natural history collections. We have universities, we have informal, uh, informal education folks who are doing this in whatever way they see fit. And as I said, we have online and on-site events, and I'll talk more about that in a second. And this all grew out of what we called the Sit Stitch Hackathon in December of 2014, where a bunch of us were together and realized that a few people were doing things like this on their own, where they would gather a bunch of people to add that digital data to natural history collections. And those digital data are often transcriptions. So each specimen has locality information, species information, collector information. And like I said, those data just aren't necessarily discoverable because they are only in that hard format. So what we'd like to do people together to help them do just that and um, we decided to make that more social to make it more collaborative and hence was born we dig bio and so here's the nuts and bolts of it we uh, work with several online transcription platforms and those are the ones listed there on the right and they're located all over the world but because it's an online resource anybody can not only um, participate in them so anybody here now that is hearing this can go to one of those websites and do some transcriptions or potentially provide annotations to specimen images. Um, but many of them also allow you to provide your own images to them. So if you happen to be in a natural history collection or have access to that, you can um, also participate that way or, or create your own project in that way. And there are also resources out there, which I'm happy to talk more about later on, um, which is if you are interested in working with the Natural History Collection, we could help find the, um, the partners that you would need in order to put images, let's say, for a certain project or a certain location online, and then um, work from there. And so through We Dig Bio, we help organize on-site events so that people can gather in a community space or a, a public space and um, purchase and trans do transcriptions together. Um, but it's also been to anybody on too, so we have had a, an just a fantastic uh, showing of people online that are communicating through social media, that are communicating through some of the resources that I'll go into a little bit more in a second. And just a, a quick hint at what this looks like. If you were to go on to this particular transcription center called Notes from Nature, you might see an image like this, which is an herbarium specimen, a plant, uh, pressed plant specimen. And then the project manager has decided here that they would like some date information and some locality information from you. And then you would click through and likely provide some habitat and locality information. Again, transcribing the information that, that is in the label there and therefore making it uh, digital and discoverable. So uh, I'm going to talk about the pilot year that we had a couple of years uh, a couple of years ago and this has all been published recently so if you'd like more of the details please um, check out that article and since then it's only grown so this was the um, the first year that we have some great graphics from because of this publication but uh, we have the data for the other ones showing that it continues to grow so we had many on-site participants hundreds of them going to their universities to their collections and and participating by transcribing and over this four-day time period, this was in October 20, October 22nd to 25th, we had over 50,000 transcription tasks completed at 20 on-site events. And those two images there on the bottom are were live during the event and were showing where the transcriptions were coming in from and also tallying how many were being done. So now this is where I think, um, so not only can you guys host an event yourself or participate yourself, but I think some of these other um, ideas and resources might be more broadly interesting and usable, uh, regardless of what kind of event you have. And we found that, or and especially if you have an online event where folks don't necessarily interact in person, but we found that things like tattoos and stickers and prizes were really um, helpful, that we had research um, we provided research lectures and tours of collections for on-site people, and we were also able to share some of those through um, online video uh, conferencing systems that we use. And we had lesson plans and games available online, and we also provided a ton of photos and stories that we shared through social media, and folks really got into that. And so, again, you see some images here from events that we've had in the past, and um, a regular transcriber of ours was providing uh, her view as she was doing some transcriptions at home, even though she wasn't at an on-site event. So some of that uh, two-way type of stuff was happening simultaneously over those four days. And here's an image of some of the tattoos and stickers that we had, and we worked with this great Libraries of Life 
app to, uh, and it has a, a phone app where you hover over the sticker or the logo, even like a photocopied version of the logo and the praying mantis would pop out of it. So that was pretty cool. And this is the video conferencing system that I mentioned. It's called Sococo, but um, this uh, other variations of this exist out there. And what's great about Sococo is that it's a space here with many rooms. And so we had individual sites host rooms. And then we also had events where they were all, all of us would meet in the room for a particular research talk. And so here we have the, the blueprint of that space with the, the talking heads up top. And we're all meeting in this in this screenshot in the University of California at Santa Barbara insect collection where they were doing some transcriptions and we were comparing notes, which was a lot of fun. And this was a screenshot from a talk that New York Botanic Garden gave about the ways that they were using collections and specimens in the research that they were doing and the conservation work they were doing. So there are so many different directions you can go with that, with um, bringing the online into people's desktops and laptops, regardless of where they are. Uh, some more images of people from around the world and to give you a sense of what it looks like. So clearly, because we are all uh, transcribing on these online platforms that, you know, it is a lot of people sitting behind laptops or, or desktops and computer labs, but that's not to say that it's not also engaging and fun. And so some of these, you can see some of the happy people here uh, helping us with the We Dig Biotranscription event. We have lots of logistical documents online, and I won't go through all of them here because they are all there. But I, I think and hope scale and small scale events, and we go through some press kits and um, planning docs and things that we think you'd be able to tap into to um, help just considerations and uh, how you can work through hosting an event at any scale. Uh, similarly with education and outreach materials that we have, we have lots of games which are, are open and free to use and modify in however you would like to. And so you might wonder why people would do this. And so we had some surveys, uh, and I won't go through all this here, but um, what motivates people to do this? Why would you participate in this event? And not only does it um, help inform the next types of events that we have, but also just the generally the communities that are interested in this. And it was everybody from undergrads to amateur botanists or other types of naturalists, so just people in the community who wanted to uh, see what was going on at their local museum or at their local university collection. And of course, um, providing some donuts or um, signing off on volunteer hours for groups was also really beneficial to people. And so I was kind of thinking about how folks could uh, integrate this particularly into their citizen science day uh, or related types of events and I think it would be really cool to have um, a kind of specimen based citizen science we dig bio type of event that was paired with a, a bio blitz where you go outside or you look online at iNaturalist uh, observations that have come in in the past or that you could contribute to as part of one of the city nature challenge um, sites that are happening around Citizen Science Day. So there are just so many opportunities to partner with things that um, can also help to enhance the experience. And if you'd like to host an event or to just be in the loop of We Dig Bio activities, feel free to sign up at wedigbio.org. We're all over social media too, so you could find us there. And as you can see from these pictures, we're not species or ageist. Anybody can participate. So please do. And um, thanks to everybody that has been a part of this. It's um, uh, quite an understatement to say that it's not just me. It is so many people who have helped to organize and be a part of this. And of course, all of the participants and hosts that have um, that have participated. So, and thanks for, thanks to you guys for listening. Great, Libby, thank you so much for sharing that. There are a couple of questions here that I'll pose to you in just a moment, but a reminder to folks, feel free to chime in with chat. Um, I really love that your presentation gave iDigBio as an example, but also highlighted other tools and opportunities that people might be able to do in an event space, no matter what kind of citizen science project they're hosting. So Coco was new to me, just a really um, fantastic tool and way to leverage participation from no matter where you are. One question with that in mind came in from uh, someone named Sten, who I believe is in Maryland. And he asked kind of a twofold question, uh, is there a way for him to be involved if he's at home with a scanner um, in iDigBio? Is a scanner even necessary? 
are you uh, just doing meta tagging? Is scanning relevant? Can you speak briefly to that? I can, yeah. So the scanning is uh, not necessary at all. All you need is a computer with a, an internet connection and all of the uh, hard work has been done for you. So all of the images that we are interested in having transcribed information for can be found online and that's one of the, the prerequisites really to be part of one of those transcription platforms is to have your specimen images um, readily available and then we put them online and then what we ask of the participants is to help transcribe the information that's on there. Great. And I'll just step in here too. I noticed there was a nice little conversation happening about um, some step in or drop in kinds of um, um, projects. And I'll just say that for We Dig Bio, we've had some luck with people having like at a, a museum, for example, or a festival, they would have a little kiosk with a couple iPads and you would just try, try, your, try your hand at some transcriptions and, you know, maybe only takes a minute or two. And, and that right there is a contribution of a couple of transcriptions that we were really um, thankful to have. And then we'd also say, hey, you know, and if you want to step into the computer lab over there, there's a whole bunch of people that are doing this. And so it was kind of this um, uh, multi-step type of initiation into We Dig Bio that we found to be effective. And um, we still have some of those kiosks around too, um, or some of the transcription platforms have maintained them. And, and it's just this nice little intro to, the, to that world. Great. Thanks for picking up on that thread. And it was a good conversation going on about drop-in events. I will just add into that conversation that we can think about um, Citizen Science Day as an entry point to citizen science, whether or not it's an actual participation. We're bringing these opportunities to the attention of many people. And if participation happens as part of that, that's great. There have been some conversations going on about what kinds of messages we want to send about citizen science. And some projects really um, it's it's not the right fit to shoehorn them into a one-off quick um, experience that the depth of participation the depth of training that's needed uh, takes more but we can certainly use citizen science day as an opportunity to open the door so just think carefully about what you choose to do and how we talk about citizen science um, so that we help people understand that yes there are some projects that you can dive right in and do right away um, other projects that may take a little bit more time but here's how you can uh, get your feet wet and and get go deep um, once you're back home. Thanks so much, Libby. Um, really glad to have you sharing those insights and ideas. And we'll turn it over to Pietro. Great. Thanks a lot. And uh, um, yeah, I really appreciated, um, Libby, that you had uh, all those pictures of, of people to, uh, to show. Um, uh, let's see, are my slides visible on there? There we go. Um, yeah, um, so it's, it's, it's a reminder to me about, about how, um, you know, you might ask, well, you know, why, why do we do something like Citizen Science Day? And, um, and I think, um, um, you know, one, one reason is, is that we're, we're building and growing a community of people who are invested in the advancement of science. And, um, and so, um, you know, coming from a project like Eyes on Owls with uh, the Stall Catchers game, um, where, um, where, you know, for us, there's a, a direct connection between the advancement of science and, and solving a societal problem like uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, you know, it's it's a nice reminder that that we love science and 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 we're we're sort of uh, um, uh, many of us are, are just passionate about science for the sake of science, but but ultimately there's the societal uh, benefit to science as the best known method for solving um, you know big problems. And um, so anyway, I'm grateful for for this opportunity to talk about stall catchers and, and some of the things we've learned um, about, uh, you know, reaching out and, and doing community building, uh, in part because uh, much of what's going on in citizen science today is in the, the conservation science space. Uh, iNaturalist put together a nice pie chart showing 
uh, kind of the allocation of, of, of scientific areas in citizen science and, and uh, medical and health-based research is this tiny little slice. So, um, you know, we're, we're absolutely uh, tickled to, um, as a minority, uh, be included in this and, and be able to share about our learnings. Um, so, um, so what's Stallcatchers? Stallcatchers is basically, it's an online game that anyone can play. And the basic idea here is that, that Cornell University has um, gobs of, of images of, of mouse brains. They're actually videos um, from live mouse brains. And, um, and in order to answer uh, questions about um, potential treatments, we actually need to look inside and figure out which vessels, um, which blood vessels in these mouse brains are flowing installed and count the vessels that are stalled. So there's, we, the, the Cornell folks have, have um, identified a relationship between blood flow and Alzheimer's disease. And, and um, if we can figure out how to restore blood flow in the Alzheimer's mice and then potentially in, Al in human Alzheimer's patients, um, then we could potentially uh, delay the onset of the disease, um, um, maybe even long enough that, that uh, you know, people don't ever have to experience symptoms of the disease. So that's, that's our goal and we keep our eye on that ball. And uh, the basic idea in the game is that um, you, you get to kind of move through these videos and, 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 and look at a, a blood vessel that's inside um, the outline, you know, you can see there's this orange outline and in there, as you scroll back and forth, this little green slider, um, a blood vessel will appear and you might see blood flowing through the vessel or you might not. And uh, machines have a very hard time making this distinction, but humans are better at it. So you just click whether you think it's flowing or stalled and, um, and that's how you play the game. Um, so, um, um, and, and I want to mention, this is my colleague, uh, Egla Ramanaskaita, who um, is our communications director. And actually, um, if she were available today, this would be, be her talk. And I'm, I'm kind of here as a proxy. So um, um, most of, uh, of these learnings that I'm sharing out are, are coming from um, you know, her ideas and her wisdom and, and wanted to acknowledge that. Uh, and by the way, this, this image is from the British Science Festival where we had a wonderful opportunity to, to engage uh, with uh, the, uh, the folks attending that event. Um, so I thought I'd just start uh, quickly with some of the online tools we developed in hopes of engaging communities in an offline context. So, um, so we had this idea of, um, of building opportunities to create um, sort of communities and communities of communities uh, and, and the team-based mechanism seemed, um, seemed useful for this. So, um, so we allow anyone on our platform to create a team. And, um, and then um, anyone can join a team and switch teams. So whenever we've had a decision point about um, should we be restrictive or liberal, we almost always err on the side of being liberal and allowing people to to sort of have as much autonomy as they can. And this ultimately, um, as you'll see, leads to some, some nice opportunities for, um, for external meetups and community development. So for example, um, you know, we give folks a, um, the opportunity to create a sense of identity for a team, which helps to bind uh, a team-based community. Um, we provide um, an opportunity to create um, uh, hyperlinks that can be shared and then when people register using those links they automatically join a specific team so anyone who wants to create a team can then broadcast out an email and say if you use this link you'll automatically join our team and be part of you know our our collective effort um, and one thing I want to mention is that that um, you, you know one, one definition of learning is is when you know you're expecting one thing to happen and something different happens. And I think much of what we've learned and, and many of the things I'm sharing out here are based on that kind of learning where, where we, we have one expectation and then all of a sudden we discover, nope, it's, it's not that way at all and, um, and, and this works better. Um, so uh, I think part of what's, uh, what's made it possible for us to learn is, is just being sort of receptive to the idea that we have no idea what we're doing. <laughs> we're learning as we go and, um, and we really appreciate any kind of feedback we get. Um, so um, so we, uh, by providing um, uh, an, a kind of a 
an internal leaderboard for each team, then people within a team can compete with each other and have kind of a friendly camaraderie competition. Um, um, but they can also sort of see that as they pool their efforts, they're actually building a team score um, and um, in, in actually accomplishing a lot of research um, collectively uh, and making a difference in, in, the, uh, in the acceleration of the Alzheimer's research. Um, at the same time, we provide a, a leaderboard across teams so that um, there can be this external competition where I might be competing with a friend on my team to see who can be at the top of our internal leaderboard, but at the same time, we're as a group um, uh, trying to compete with these other teams. And this sort of taps into, I think this, um, you know, I'm not an anthropologist, but but I think there's this sort of intrinsic, ingrained sense of cooperation and competition in all humans, and and um, and so we try to provide opportunities to to derive um, satisfaction in both of those pursuits. Um, so um, quickly, uh, just some of the, the the events and and lessons learned. So we went into a retirement community in Florida, and. Um, and we found someone who was a resident in that community to who was interested in Alzheimer's disease to to run a workshop with the local community members. And one of the discoveries we made is that at least in this demographic, there was a big concern. I think um, um, uh, that 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 these folks were very conscientious about not wanting to hurt the research data. And so we discovered a big barrier in participation was this fear of making a mistake and somehow. Um, you know, adversely affecting the scientific data coming out of the system. So, so then we learned that it was very important in our messaging um, to to explain that our methods prevent that kind of problem from occurring. That we can, even if they're making lots of mistakes, that we can still extract research value, and that there's there's really no way uh, that they can tamper in a way that would harm the data. So, um, you know, as Libby mentioned, we're not speciesist at all. Um, if a cat wants to tap on the keyboard, um, you know, it can't hurt the data and, and if the cat's lucky we might get something useful out of it. Um, so, uh, and you know, and, and once this message is conveyed, then people relax into it and, and, um, and, and get very uh, excited about it. So, um, again, this, uh, this idea of, of providing team opportunities ended up um, um, coinciding with uh, the Crowd in the Cloud documentary event and so there was a nice opportunity to to introduce this new feature and um, and launch uh, a team competition uh, give people everywhere a chance to create their own teams and participate in this um, it ended up being a, a month-long competition uh, we later uh, learned that a month is a long time for a competition um, and uh, and and that uh, uh, you know subsequent competitions were were uh, ended up being much shorter than that. So um, it turned out that a um, a school in Boise, Idaho, uh, a middle school teacher there, had kind of the uh, the wherewithal to to form a team. She's a technology teacher there, Miss Erin Davis, and she. Um, she got all of her students involved in this, and it became kind of a viral um, viral event. Uh, the The word spread quickly. Um, there was an opportunity for the kids when they had free time to to play the game, and um, and the way that Aaron puts it is, I organized a team, challenged my computer students to design the logo, um, did a quick tutorial, and then it spread from there. And they were playing in the cafeteria, um, in the hallways between classes, and they got really into the competition. Um, and in fact, the competition was most heated between these middle schoolers and the folks in the retirement. You know, it was the grandchildren and the grandparents who were neck and neck throughout much of the competition. Um, we also learned that when you combine pizza with um, a citizen science platform, uh, that you uh, you get scientific results. And um, and it was actually Miss Davis's genius idea to hold a pizza party on the last day of the competition. Um, and here are the students on that day um, winning uh, the, the team competition. So, um, so one of the things we also learned is that there's value in going back to these communities when you reach out and engage a community to then sort of complete that cycle um, that, um, that good things can, can come out of that and, and it can um, encourage uh, ongoing participation and growth 
So, um, you know, if you do do something on Citizen Science Day and, um, and you have engagement, to think ahead about how you might go back to the folks who participated, a way to keep track of who participated, and then reach out to them for future activities. Maybe someday you want to have your own citizen science project, but you don't today, so you do something you know, using an existing project, and, uh, and then you can tap that community later. And, and these, are, these are overlapping communities. So um, we also found that building partnerships with, um, with journalists, forward-thinking journalists who care about citizen science and the advancement of science uh, is very useful. It creates win-win opportunities. It's positive publicity for the school. It's positive publicity for the project. Um, you know, we gave a citizen science trophy to uh, Lake Hazel Middle School, and, um, and we were excited to see that trophy get into the same trophy case that has the football and lacrosse trophies and, and other sports uh, trophies. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I think there's a, a mutual advantage um, for all citizen science enthusiasts to see this become more mainstream. Um, and we wanted to share this message with them and with their local communities. So um, ultimately, um, I got to meet with some of the students who were involved in this, and they gave us all kinds of ideas, and this is some of the value back. They said, here are some features you should have. You should have a game in game. You know, we want an avatar. When we do really good things, we want to get we want to get stuff to dress up our avatar and distinguish ourselves from other players. And we also want to have competitions with other schools and other school districts. And here's how we're going to help you do that. And they were pretty much running the show. So we have a new board of directors, I think, made up of middle school students. And uh, they were very proud of the trophy, by the way. So um, just uh, keeping an eye on the time here. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just mention, um, we, we also uh, held an international catch-a-thon, which was a synchronized event. Uh, we decided to steal Ms. Davis' idea to use uh, pizza to incentivize participation and discovered the hard way that sending pizza money to Sub-Saharan Africa is, is not easy. Um, but, uh, but it was worthwhile for, the, for this event, and um, we had um, something like 15 countries and six continents all participating in exactly the same moment and um, extra shout out to the folks in Australia who had to be awake at three in the morning to participate in this. Um, but this was, this was exciting. I think the coordination effort is, is more challenging when it's a synchronized event. If you're just doing something for Citizen Science Day in one locale, it's certainly a lot easier than that. Um, then uh, the Austrians decided to decline participation in the international event. They wanted to do their own event, so we supported that. And again, there's this idea that flexibility is, is really beneficial um, in many ways. And, and uh, the huge payoff here is that um, they self-organized. They got lots of organizations in their country, scientific organizations, Alzheimer's research organizations, to participate in their catch-a-thon. And in a single hour, they actually exceeded uh, the research contribution of the international catchathon. So um, having that goal and, and having awareness of that goal, I think, led them to achieve something they might not otherwise have achieved. Um, so um, upcoming is the Sid Sci Med Blitz, and I think another lesson we've learned is that cooperation among projects and among citizen science stakeholders is is almost always beneficial. And we're we're so excited to be working with um, Mark DeCure and, and Cochran Crowd uh, on this upcoming event. Um, so uh, just a, a few final uh, kind of heuristics, I guess, that came out of this is um, you know when you're doing something global, it helps to have it in multiple languages, and uh, you can usually find people in those locales willing to help with the translation. So crowdsource everything. Um, um, having a checklist for folks who want to do the meetups um, is very helpful. We do this, so if you, if you want to do something using stall catchers, we have resources from our website that you can find that gives you all the checklists you need to figure out how to run an event using stall catchers. Um, advertise through all the outline, online communities at your disposal, through social media communities, um, you know, Facebook, of course. And, um, uh, you know, having a memorable hashtag is helpful. It's also a way to track activity in the project. And, um, and then 
doing this kind of thing, like this webinar today, having a live stream of the event, again, helps to build and bind communities. It's not, a, not critical for, for a local meetup, but we found it um, to be uh, useful in terms of building relationships. So, um, so just in closing, I guess, um, you know, if you don't have your own project and you're looking for one, it sounds like there are lots of options out there. Um, we certainly wouldn't mind if you gave stall catchers a try. Uh, you don't have to go outside to do it, um, but uh, uh, you can do it from pretty much anywhere. And if you contact us, and I'll, I'll put the link on the chat at info at eyesonals.com, then we'll create a challenge so you can have your own live leaderboard, your own private link to a live leaderboard that you could use for your challenge. And um, this is kind of what it looks like in practice, uh, and, and we'd love to support that. So I hope this is useful, and thanks again. Great, Pietro. Thank you so much for highlighting that. I'm conscious of time, and I know Richard has one more thing that he wants to share with us just in summary for everyone. I didn't see any specific questions in the chat for your project, but what I will ask is that for those of you as panelists, um, if you're willing, I will share your email addresses when I share out the recording video and people can contact you directly. Uh, with additional questions, but really glad folks were here um, and we can see the full range of Citizen Science Day event opportunities from fully global and distributed to everything as local and personal as a happy hour or a volunteer recognition. So thanks for sharing the, this range of options. Richard, would you like to close us out here? Absolutely. Um, the uh, my last slide is kind of picking up what you were talking about, Jennifer, um, is to make sure that you all know how to reach out to Libby, Pietro, and myself. So here's our email addresses, as well as our Twitter handles, website URLs, and the Twitter handles for our different projects. So please reach out to us and ask us questions um, related directly to the project, related to holding events that are similar to our projects. Um, and finally, I just want to give a big thank you to everyone for participating in our webinar today. Um, I also want to thank Libby and Pietro for being wonderful panelists. Big thank you to Jennifer for um, being a wonderful moderator and going over all the technical aspects with this panelists. Made me feel really comfortable. Um, another shout out to our Citizen Science Task Force for all the support they gave me and all the resources that they are building for Citizen Science Day. And of course, I think we all want to say a big shout out to all of the citizen science and community science participants that exist because we can't do it without them. So thank you all so much for being a part of this webinar. Thanks, everyone. Glad you could join us. Reminder that we'll circulate links and email addresses with the recording, which you should have by the end of the day tomorrow. Really looking forward to seeing what Citizen Science Day events you all come up with and put on. Um, there's a whole range of options out there. If you're interested in BioBlitzes, look at last year's recorded webinar, and maybe next year we'll highlight some of your event uh, options here for future coordinators. So I'll echo thanks to everyone for joining in. Thank you, Richard, for convening this, Pietro and Libby for sharing your ideas, and um, glad to have you all inspiring us to move forward with Citizen Science Day. Thanks, everyone.